What gradually began to happen was not only depletion of the nutrients, but what began to happen was that without cover, without uh, com cover year-round on these crops, the, and the blowing winds and the rains uh, when the, during the rainy seasons would take these topsoils and fill the rivers with um, tons and tons of soil. Uh, over time, this, this depleted the soils and it became what was famous as the Dust Bowl because these soils have been depleted and diminished by the elements over a period of time. Basically, we have a soil that erodes easily, and so if it's left unprotected, you get a lot of erosion. And uh, the slopes uh, aren't real steep, but they're long, so consequently, water builds up as it moves down the slope and carries a lot of soil with it. And uh, so once that soil is plowed, worked, uh, left unprotected, ever how you want to call it, uh, Basically, that uh, causes erosion, and what was happening beginning back in the 30s and all the way through to the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, we were losing several inches of topsoil, and uh, the topsoil is by far the most important. And it's the one that guarantees that uh, over the centuries that you will have uh, enough productivity, sustain your productivity on your soil types and things like that. And, and it was a problem. We, weren't un we were unable to do the type of farming that we were doing and sustain our soil types. Because the soil is not an inanimate object made up of sand and clay and even new organic matter. The beneficial part of soil is the living part, the worms, the microorganisms, the things that we don't see very often but are still producing the crops. I grew up like most farmers when I started and I love to till the soil. I love to turn it black. I love to make it look clean. I love the smell of it. I mean, there's nothing like the smell of a farmer who's gone through a field with a disc or something. And that was what you did. And that's what your dad did and your grandpa did and the grandpa before your great grandfather did that. So, I mean, that's what you did. That's how you did it. And so today we have a lot more information regarding our environment, regarding water quality, regarding uh, carbon emissions, all of these things add up. So today we have the science and honestly, a lot of the research to back up why tilling is not what you wanna do. We have lost over half the organic matter in the Great Plains because of tillage through wind erosion, soil, you know, water. And so it's, um, it's a bad practice. And, you know, we always say the plow is a four letter word. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a bad practice, but it's really, really hard to change anybody's behavior and farmers don't change easily. The best farmer, in my opinion, has dirty hands about 10 months out of the year. Brown handed farmer, brown collar working, if you want to call it that. When we dig in to see how deep the, the uh, seed is planted, for instance, it needs to go in about an inch and a half to two inches deep. What you see when you dig down that, that amount tells you everything about your soil. If I dig down three or four times and don't see an earthworm, I think there's something wrong. I look at soil as building something for, you know, you're maintaining something for long-term value, just like you would with your body. You're gonna tear your body up, or you're gonna go in and let Muhammad Ali or somebody beat you up every year, you know? I mean, that's what you're doing to your soil. You're beating it up, you're tearing it up. And, and in the process, you're adding more and more compaction. And so you, you just, it, it's a hard sell for farmers, but soil health is your future. And so, you know, what you do to that soil in the process of farming it is gonna impact that future. Following the Dust Bowl, there was a combination of factors. Number one was that the U.S. economy uh, was in a depression, and there was a need to employ people, to give jobs to people. There was a growing concern of how the natural resources of the U.S. had been abused. So uh, through a combination of public uh, programs, the Soil Conservation Service was formed, uh, the WPA, many different programs came into play to, conser to conserve land, to provide jobs and incomes for farmers living off the land, and to try to rebuild that productive agricultural sector on the plains that had uh, blown away during the, during the Dust Bowl. 
you've got to do something differently. But but we didn't do it. You know, we, we did some things. We put, you know, in the in the forties and fifties, you know, they were they, you know, eventually they developed, you know, certain programs you could, you know, the soil bank program and certain things you could enroll. But 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 it wasn't about the, the bottom line is it's not about taking soil and farmland out of production. It's about protecting and taking care of your soil and keeping farmland in production. And so, you know, the programs have mainly been designed on how to either pay you not to produce or pull certain land out of production. And it, they've never really focused on the, on the most important aspect, which is how do you farm, keep land in production, and take care of it. When you do t- traditional tillage, and basically we started with a moldboard plow, and then in Kentucky, and then we advanced uh, to some extent to a chisel plow and uh, a disc, which uh, didn't turn the soil quite as much, but it was still extensive tillage and it's still extensive uh, disturbing of the soil. Anytime you do that, either one of those, uh, basically you increase the the organic matter decomposition, which releases nutrients, which releases nitrogen, and uh, in the short term, actually, it's a, it's a pretty neat thing and, and, and works pretty well. Uh, the only problem is that you are deteriorating the soil. You're breaking down the soil structure, you're losing organic matter, which helps maintain the soil structure, and you're losing nutrients, and the biggest part is you're, you're losing soil, you're losing sustainability. So uh, it, it worked well, but it just wasn't sustainable. So I think it was individuals who looked at their farm and said, I can improve, I can do better than this. Because think of it, most farmers buy a piece of equipment that a manufacturer has decided they want to sell you. They engineered it um, and they decided it's what they want to sell you. It's it's not, you know, now there's, that's not true in 100% of the cases, but it's true in a lot of cases. So they're looking at, what can I produce that I can sell that I can make money on? And so it wasn't always driven by, and it still isn't driven by, in my opinion, what's the best for the environment? What's the best for water quality? What is the best for a, a whole host of things that are gonna protect your soil for 100 years or 200 years? Um, because if you look at great civilizations, primarily failed because they exhausted their soil and they couldn't feed their people. I mean, that's true in a number of cases. So we just make the same mistake over and over and over. No-till started in this area because uh, we needed something like no-tillage, but it had to do with the people. It had to do with the circumstances that occurred at that time. Technology, uh, the advance of technology is based on the advance of other parts of technology. And so consequently, we had advanced to the point that no-till could happen, but nobody quite realized it and knew how to put it together. And so there was a gentleman in, in Kentucky and uh, also a few that tried in small areas, other places, that uh, began to dabble in the fact that we'd, we'd probably have this. And uh, so it, it was a time uh, that uh, had come because the technology was available. When the idea of no-till came along, Traditional farmers were unenthusiastic, to say the least. It was heresy uh, to uh, not to con- consider that the soil had to be opened to breathe, to receive the sunlight, to receive the, to receive the water and the seed. It seemed uh, quite foreign to farmers at the time that you could leave the surface intact and plant into that surface. And even when you see, even today, when people talk about agriculture, a lot of times they'll talk about a cultivated field to show that because it's pretty and it's, it's neat. And so, uh, you no, know, it, uh, they didn't like the way it looked. It, it was, it was uh, totally different than anything they'd ever done before. They were satisfied with the way they were cropping already and they didn't want to change. And uh, I, I wasn't sure they went right for a while. <laughs> there was a considerable bit of local resistance to the adoption of no-till. I remember as a child seeing the first crop planted in no-tillage. And there were more than one of our neighbors who ran off the road as they looked at it and didn't watch where they were going. There was a phrase that was coined around here which said, no-till, no crop. Uh, Part of it was um, the real need uh, to early open the soil so that the heat could get into the soil and warm it, uh, which would extend the growing season. It was also uh, important to open it up in order to, uh, to receive the, to have a good seed bed. 
so that the farmers really felt like that pulverizing the soil, plowing deeply, pulverizing the soil would, would make um, a good seed bed and give good contact with the seed. As it, as it turns out, this was not necessarily the case, but the heresy was, it was, took a long time to, to put down this notion that no-till was a, a, an unhealthy way to farm. Um, there was a belief that it would lead to uh, destructive practices, that it would lead to a decline in fertility, when in fact just the opposite uh, turns to have happened. As that was established as a predominant practice, the new generation, the sons of those who said no till, no crop, adopted it enthusiastically because they saw the savings in fuel, in labor, in soil erosion, so many different advantages to no tillage. Technology spreads because it makes sense to businessmen. And if the bottom line is greater after having done it, many people will be interested in it. If the bottom line, if the profit is less, people will not adopt it. If you want a farmer to change the way he does things, and you want a farmer to trade in equipment and get something different, there better be something in it that makes sense because he's running a business. It's all about the profit. So you're not gonna to go to that guy and say, well, it's a good thing for you because you sequester some carbon. He's gonna say, so what? I mean, he's gonna do what he's doing. Now, if you, if you have carbon credits in place and you say, look, you can earn X amount of dollars an acre and it's, and it's worth it to him, it's profitable to him, he's gonna say, I'll consider that. When my dad st first started talking about no tillage, I think one of the first calls he made was to Dr. Shirley Phillips who was with the University of Kentucky Extension Service. Dr. Phillips came down the following year, 1963, and the two of them did several test plots, trying uh, populations, herbicides, insecticides, varieties, put in a lot of time together, working right out here on, on the farm in uh, 1963. As a result of that, uh, word got out and busloads of people, field days from all over the United States started coming in. And all of those 1960s and even up into the 1970s, there were thousands and thousands of people, not just from the United States, but also from South America particularly. I know there were a number of visitors from Brazil, Argentina. Uh, I can't even name all the countries, but it, it spread quickly simply because it made sense. So uh, they wanted to know what was happening, and they came, and they came by the hundreds. Uh, we would have, uh, during the summertime, uh, during their winter, uh, we would have many groups come from Argentina and Brazil, and uh, what are you doing, how are you doing this, how are you doing that, how do you control this, uh, how do you get this planter to work, uh, all those types of questions, and, and what are your yields, and. Uh, so uh, they just kept coming, and they came here, they came to Lexington, they came to John uh, Harry Young's farm, and uh, so they wanted it. And then the, the people from the University of Kentucky began to go down there and, uh, and see what they were doing and help them and make changes and recommendations, and it was, uh, it was a tremendous change that took place there as well as here. To help this technology spread, there were a number of factors involved. One of, it, one of them is that farmers learn from other farmers. Uh, what's most important to them is uh, how does this new technique affect the pocketbook? How does it affect uh, the yield of the crop? How does it affect profitability? So there was interplay of several factors. Farmers could not afford to give up much yield in order to use this new technique. But the other side of it was the cost of production. They were saving on cost of production. So you could have given up a little bit of yield if your cost dropped even more. But as it turns out, they were able, the farmers using the no-till agriculture were getting as good yields with no-till agriculture, but also able to reduce their costs. So it was a, so in order for a farmer to want to adopt that, it was necessary for them to see that it worked on other farms. It was also good to have scientists coming along in the form of extension agents who understood the technology, had worked with it on an experimental basis, and knew that the technologies worked and were able to inform farmers fully of all the techniques that are required uh, to accompany a no-till agricultural system. The 
predominant factor in helping farmers though to adopt the new technology is for them to see it on a farmer's field and for them to see that the yields are as good uh, as if they had uh, used uh, conventional agricultural production practices.